Our call to worship. <clears throat> On an ordinary Sunday, we come to worship God. We come trusting God will speak to us. We come hoping God will surprise us. On this day, like every other day, we seek to follow Jesus. We follow believing Jesus will be with us. We follow hoping Jesus will work through us. On this day, we lift our souls to God's Spirit. We open our hearts that the Spirit may fill us. We open our hands that we might be a gift to others. Join me in our morning prayer. Creating God, you grasp chaos and shape it into new heavens brimming with light, new earth teeming with life. Word of God, you shape our lips and loosen our tongues 
that we might witness to your kingdom where enemies take naps together. Spirit blowing free, open us that we might be caught by your wind. Fill us that we might overflow with generosity to others. Teach us that we would make known our thanks to the farthest shores of the universe. Three in one God, may we follow your example of relationship. Celebrate diversity and unity. Amen. Our first hymn is God You Spin the Whirling Planets in the Blue Hymnal, page 285. to confession. If you are looking for proof of God's love, here it is. At the very moment we realize we cannot help ourselves, that is the time we discover God has saved us in Jesus Christ. Join me as we pray to our God saying, listening God, how easily we pat ourselves on the back for the lives we lead. We welcome the praise of others but have little compassion for those who have failed us. We assume that a comfortable life is our birthright, yet we need to torture the suffering from those around us. We boast of the good we do, but forget to thank you for all that you have given to us. Forgive us, companion of compassion, for breaking your heart and disappointing your hopes for us. As we seek to follow your child, may we be found with those whose lives are barren, with those who know little laughter in their day, and with those who have received no love from others. For in their presence we will find you, O Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In this time of silence, please take a few moments for your own private prayer of confession. Our assurance of pardon. 
Listen to the good news. The kingdom of God is very near, as close as a child's laughter, as embracing as a father's love, as enfolding as a mother's caress. We are God's people called that we may follow, gifted that we may serve, forgiven that we might bring hope. Thanks be to God. Amen. today is Faith of Our Fathers with Jane Gerald on the piano and Martha Denkenberger on the organ. Thank you, that was beautiful. <clears throat> now for our prayer of illumination. Life-giving God, open our hearts and minds that we will receive and then act on your message of love, hope, and grace in your living word, Jesus, amen. Our first scripture lesson today is from Genesis 18, one through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mare, where he was sitting at the entrance to his, 
tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and then you may all wish, wash to wish all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, these three Sihas of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who, who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Please join me in our responsive reading from Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious is the sight of the Lord, is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. In our first scripture lesson, both Sarah and Abraham hear an impossible thing. Old lady Sarah is gonna have a child, a son to be particular. And the response was laughter. We're told in the previous chapter when Abraham was first given this news, he literally rolled on the ground laughing. A true LOL, incredulous. Unbelieving, they can't believe it. <laughs> Say what? God, you're gonna do what? You want me to do what? <sighs> Impossible. Yet our Bible is filled with ordinary people called to dare the impossible. We have Noah and the ark right before this story. We have Moses and Pharaoh. Listen to Sarah's reaction to his to this impossible news that she receives. And this is Sarah's story, a meditation on her laughter by Donald Schmidt. Laugh? You bet I laughed. A deep, disgusted, angry, confused laugh. And Abraham laughed too, don't forget that. Imagine pregnant at my age, all those years 
of longing, praying, hoping, dreaming. For what? Nothing. More wandering, more loneliness, more nasty remarks from the neighbors. Oh, how sad, poor Sarah, barren all these years. I wonder what sin she's paying for. And then to be told this bad joke, pregnant at 90. How could I, what could I do but laugh? Crying's out of the question with something so ludicrous as this. But then reality and the anger set in. Why now, God? Why after all of these years, what's the point? I've never known you, God, to be this cruel. And yet, after the initial shock, we thought, why not? God has always been surprising us, shocking us, pushing the limits just a little more each time, inviting us to trust in new and unusual ways. Was this really any different than all the other challenges? I remember the night after the messengers had come, Abraham had um, tipped the wine skin a little, and he crawled into the tent rather sheepishly, almost like a nervous teenager. He made some silly remark about needing to sleep with me, how it was God's will, and we laughed and loved into the night. And when it came true, I was horrified. All the joy I had once had dreaming of giving birth gave way to deathful fear. Abraham held me close and we cried and questioned together and wondered and wondered. And no small eternity later, Isaac was born. Isaac means he laughs. And I whose dreams had all but dried up held that little bundle to my breast. And as I watched Abraham hold him aloft, so proud beyond words, I was overcome with joy and thanksgiving for our God, so full of surprises. Laugh? You bet I laughed. We turn now to our gospel, to Jesus and his disciples. The twelve are about to be sent out on their first missionary journey. When they heard what they would be asked to do, I wonder if they laughed in astonishment as well. Or perhaps they just shook their heads in disbelief. Or I wonder if they thought they said, thought to themselves, yeah, we got this. Listen to the need that they will be called to fill and the, the instructions for getting it done. And today I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's The Message. Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places, reported kingdom news, and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers. On your knees and pray for harvest hands. The prayer was no sooner prayed than it was answered. Jesus called 12 of his followers and sent them out into the ripe fields. He gave them power to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. This is the list of the 12 he sent. Simon, they called him Peter or Rock, and Andrew, his brother. James, Zebedee's son, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax man. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who later turned on him. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. 
And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick, raise the dead, touch the untouchables, kick out the demons. You've been treated generously, so live generously. Don't think you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you start. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment. And all you need to keep it, that going is three meals a day. Travel light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Excuse me one second. I felt like I had a cat hair on my nose. Sorry. The disciples, we're told, are called to do what Jesus does. We're told what he does first and then what they're going to do. In both cases, Sarah and Abraham and the disciples, the task is overwhelming. Our abilities are inadequate. Jesus saw the crowds around him and had compassion. All the crowds have been around him for quite a while, but the time is right. Ripe? They're ready for compassionate direction. They're ready to hear the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus took 12 of those learners around him, AKA the disciples, and it was time for them to have some experiential learning. He told them to go and repeat his message, the kingdom is near, and to go and repeat his actions, healing, kicking out evil spirits, curing diseases, raising people from the dead. You know, all that impossible, improbable, miracle working stuff. Don't you think that the disciples were nervous, scared even? How could they do what Jesus did? Heal and preach and such. How can we? Do we dare to try the impossible? Or do we throw our hands in the air because it's too much? The harvest is huge, but the workers are few. In the time of Kublai Khan, so the story goes, two merchants from the West came to this emperor of China, India, and all the East. Niccolo and Matteo Polo, Marco's dad and uncle, spoke their faith to Kublai Khan. He was much interested. He told them, go to your high priest, the Pope, and say, send me 100 men skilled in your religion. If they are convincing, he said, I shall be baptized, and then all my barons and great men, and then all their subjects. And so there will be more Christians here than there are in your parts. But, Back in Rome, someone said, impossible, improbable. We need good men for the job. We need to discuss this. Sound familiar? Pope Gregory X, unable to see the future, only sent two men 30 years later, and neither one of them arrived. The opportunity was lost. The harvest had passed. Jesus saw the need around him and sent out the ones at hand. Were they good people for the job? Were they eloquently trained scholars who had MDs for their healing techniques? Yeah, no, not at all. They were a handful of fishermen, an ex-civil servant, a fanatical zealot who you needed to keep on a short leash, a doubter and a betrayer. But Jesus believed in them, that they could do this impossible task and empowered them to do so. And he broke it down for them to make it easier to handle. Kind of like Maria von Trapp teaching the kids about music, do, re, mi, steps. So step number one, pray. On your knees, Jesus said, pray for harvest hands. The starting place for all of our tasks, both simple ones and impossible ones. 
is prayer. Pray first, opening ourselves to the opportunity for God to do great things through us. Number two, travel in pairs. The other gospels are more explicit about this. Matthew subtly enforces it by coupling the 12 as they are named. We're not meant to go to loan. Lone Rangers need not apply. We have an old joke about we Presbyterians that we love committees. Yet working together is biblical. We have Noah with his wife and kids. Moses worked with his brother Aaron. Sarah and Abraham were a team. Jesus called the disciples. When there's something you need to do, when there's a task before you, invite someone else to join you, to do it with you. We're in this together. And together, we can do it. Third instruction, keep it simple, travel light. I love how Peterson words it. We don't need a fundraiser. We don't have to travel overseas. We don't tackle public enemies. Instead, some ideas. Bring in a can of food for the treehab box. Yeah, in the corner of the missionary room, it gets forgotten sometimes. Invite a friend to worship. Visit a sick neighbor. Make a phone call, write a note. Say a prayer for those on our prayer list in the bulletin. Keep it simple, but do it in faith. Or, most importantly, do it as one sent by Jesus. That's the meaning of an apostle. And we all are apostles sent by him. Not to replace him, but to join him. Many long years ago, I loved reading the Mitford books. I don't know if anybody remembers them, but the main character in them was Father Tim Cavanaugh. And when there seemed to be an impossible task before him or others, he would say, Philippians 4.13 for Pete's sake. And that is, we can do all things through or with Jesus who strengthens us. A guy I knew named Bill Cash had a dream. Every week, he would bring together his, uh, bring his pull wagon, at least this long, wide. Um, he'd bring it to church to get the items that were collected and take it to the local food pantry. And his dream was that one week, the wagon would be full. So the church council one night was kicking around a whole bunch of ideas, and one was to fulfill Bill's dream. And inevitably, someone went, we tried that before, it didn't work. Bill, Bill's dream and the trailer he also had for it with food, impossible, unlikely, won't happen, we won't ever get that much. Yet the word went out without telling Bill. And when the donation day arrived, not only was Bill's wagon full, but the trailer was as well. What a dream fulfilled. Did that stop world hunger? Yeah, no. Did the church feed hungry families in their community? You bet they did. We are not called to bring in the whole harvest by ourselves, nor are we called to be mini-me's of Jesus. We're merely to join the harvesting hands being certain that God will provide both our needs and our talents. Get ready for laughter. Get ready to soar. God has impossible, improbable plans in store. May we do and dare. Amen? Our second hymn, also in the blue hymnal, is Call as Partners in Christ's Service. It's on page page 343.
affirmation of faith as it comes to us from Romans chapter 8. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. For our pastoral prayer today, I share with you a prayer for fathers written by Marin Tirabasi. Please join your hearts with me in prayer. Father God, we are praying for fathers. Fathers up at night with newborns. Fathers bent under college debt. Fathers who are good with one age of child and haven't a clue with another. We're praying for fathers, balancing self and home and work and parenting, especially when no one seems to notice. We're praying for fathers of adolescents and for those who are adolescents themselves, as well as many who prop up their elbows when their hands slip on the gift of accountability. We're praying for grandfathers and trans fathers, godfathers and grieving fathers foster fathers and adopting fathers, solo fathers and stepfathers, fathers-in-law and fathers-in-neighbor, more grandfathers tiptoeing around divorce. We're also praying for teachers, pastors, coaches, counselors, who mix a tiny bit of what they know from fathering into relationships with dozens of children and learn the rhythm of stepping back. We're praying for those living with their mistakes as fathers, small thoughtlessnesses that call for self-forgiveness or deep damage needing repentance or transformation. We're praying for those who want to be fathers and those who have wanted to be, but it never happened. We're praying for those who miss their fathers because of death or distance, deep difference or disappearance. And we're praying for those who miss their children because of death or distance, deep difference or disappearance. Be a parent to them all, O oh God, on this day and all the days of the year. We pray for those who have been so violated by men in relationship to them that the very name Father is a wound. Heal them with time and anger, memory, love, and support. As we approach this civic day with its tangle of knotted emotions, draw out for each of us from your fathoms of tenderness, care, and strength for our most intimate needs. Named here, barely whispered to ourselves, or still hidden in the cave rooms of our souls. God in community, holy and one, each of us, all of us, lift our prayers to you as we gather our voices to pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. We have been blessed with more gifts than we ever realize. As we offer our gifts this morning, may we offer our hearts to God in gratitude.
gracious God, may we be joyful in our giving and in our living, knowing that we can do great things empowered by your Holy Spirit. We give ourselves again into your hands. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 276 in the blue hymnal, Great is Thy Faithfulness. There's going to be a special session meeting in Linda's office following worship. Hopefully we won't be too terribly long, so those of us in choir won't be too late for our choir practice. Here now the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.